Coming up next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. I also will give you the president's best new member's name of the year today. Uh, please join us next Friday, January 19th, uh, for a program about the environmental challenges Portland faces from the perspective of immediate past director of the state's Department of Environmental Quality, Langdon Marsh, that will be here at the MAC. On Tuesday, June 16th, this coming Tuesday, I encourage you to join the Growth Management Environmental Issue Committee as they host a breakfast conversation with Congressman Earl Blumenauer. The breakfast will be at the Benson Hotel and it will begin at 7.30 in the morning. Prepaid reservations are required. To make reservations, please call Suzanne at the club's office. And as is increasingly fashionable these days, I also encourage you to visit the Enhanced City Club website at www.pdxcityclub.org. Um, members of the City Club staff have done a remarkable job in making that website serve the best interest of club members and the city. You have access to research reports, past club Friday program presentations, as well as up coming events and membership information. Please check it out. Our board host today is Patty Tillett, President-elect of City Club and Principal with Zimmer Guns Lafraska Partnership. It is his honor to ask today's first question of our speaker. Following Patty's question, and I think everyone knows the drill by now, we will open the program to questions from the membership and please start lining up even before Patty is finished with his question so that we can have as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a member of the club and please limit your question to 30 seconds or less. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Pacificare, Pope and Talbot Incorporated, and Zimmer Gunzel Frasca Partnership. As always, we are very grateful for their support. It's now my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Jim Johnson, Oregon Site Manager and Vice President of the Technology and Manufacturing Group at Intel. Jim has been with the company since 1974, the year he received his Master of Science degree in Computer Science from Stanford. My perverse thought this morning, and I tried to have at least one before noon, <laughs> relates to the current national obsession over reality TV and Jim Johnson's clarion call to improve the state's higher education environment in support of engineering. Jim, have you and your colleagues in the high-tech industry considered Technology Island? Jim Johnson is increasingly concerned that Oregonians are uncomfortable with the notion of striving towards excellence. Somehow that spacks of elitism, which seems incompatible with our prevailing culture of egalitarianism. Good, somehow, is good enough. Jim and his colleagues in the high-tech community, however, want to help us change that mantra. As it has grown, Intel has emerged as one of the state's most influential and engaged corporate citizens and is making its presence known with increasing economic and political participation. Jim, for example, regularly consults with the governor on a broad set of public policy matters, including tax policy and education. As mentioned, Jim Johnson is probably best known for tirelessly advocating on behalf of better education. The state's future economic health, he argues, is inextricably linked to the development of a top-tier school of engineering and a doubling of the number of top quality engineers necessary to support the state's robust participation in the new economy. But in addition to an educational program that will fuel our economic health, 
it seems there's an important opportunity here to develop a broader based curriculum that will also fuel our flagging civic health. In this context, I was reminded of an article I read several years ago in Technology News that trumpeted the increased importance of engineers receiving a broad educational experience that includes the liberal arts. The author argued that as technology takes an ever larger role in corporate, national, and world affairs, and as the audience for technology becomes much more diverse, there's a growing need for engineers to be better communicators and more engaged in civic life in order to be more effective. Not only might more broadly educated engineers be better able to explain technology to their fellow citizens and hopefully ease some of the psychological and cultural anxieties prompted by the new economy, but they might also be more inclined to create products that are, for example, more environmentally benign and socially beneficial. And then, of course, there are the wonderful stories about Nicolo Telsa reporting that he saw the 8C induction motor while reciting Goethe. And closer to home, Reed alumnus Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computer, who credits his early success as a computer programmer to a dance class he took at college. I don't know what similar aha moment we're about to experience, but please join me in welcoming Jim Johnson to the podium. I've had many introductions in my life. That's probably one of the best. <laughs> I, um, I think we'll just go right into the questions now, since you already <laughs> know the topic. But uh, actually, I wanted to talk about a couple of things today. Uh, one of the things I won't be talking about, however, will be Intel specifically. I won't be mentioning our 15,000 employees <laughs> here in Oregon. I won't be talking about the billion dollars that we spend in the economy every year are the $9 million that we've donated uh, to Oregon uh, schools and nonprofits, are the 50,000 hours that our employees uh, volunteer every year. I also won't talk about the $10 that we pay uh, for every hour that one of our employees volunteers at a school to that school, and nor will I talk about our Teach the Future program, which I think is a very exciting program, in which Intel, along with a couple other companies like Microsoft, have committed to training over 400,000 teachers worldwide on how to use technology in the classroom, and specifically how 6,000 of those teachers will be right here in Oregon. But I want to talk about something that's really more important than all of that. We in Oregon have a very, very important decision to make, and we're making it right now. Actually, we're, gonna, we're they're making it down in Salem in the next six months about our future. And we as Oregonians need to make sure that our voices are heard. The decision that is about to be made is an extremely profound decision about our future, and more importantly, about the future for our children. I'm a father of four daughters, and I really, truly want all four of my daughters to grow up, and if they choose to get married and live here in the state of Oregon. Because, and if they then choose to get married, I hope they choose to have children, which means I'll have grandchildren, and I want to be near my grandchildren. And where they are is where I will be, and I would love that to be here. But in order for their families to function just like my family had to function, there needed to be good jobs, good paying jobs, in which uh, people could earn a wage that sus could sustain that family. Now, I'm very uh, fortunate in that uh, when I married my wife, uh, gosh, 26, 7 years ago, 20, almost 27 years ago, I married into a skiing family. I had never skied before. But ever since I've married her, every Christmas we go to Colorado and we go skiing. And I had an interesting experience this uh, trip. And uh, my 19-year-old daughter, after three years of hounding me, I don't know, it must have been a moment of insanity that came over me, I decided to try snowboarding. How many here have ever had that experience? Well, the, the, no, you will know uh, per, uh, personally when I'm talking about the rest of you, don't try it. Uh, a friend of mine said there's a very high entry cost into learning how to be a snowboarder. 
And that entry cost is that you fall a lot. And when you're on a snowboard and you fall, you fall hard. And I can talk about my sprained ankle that I'm recovering from, or I could talk about my bruised uh, rib that I'm recovering from, but uh, I eventually learned to do it. But I, what it made me realize is that almost at any time you make an investment in the future, and certainly learning to snowboard is an investment in the future, is that you have to pay the price up front before you get the gain. And a lot of times we have to face those kinds of decisions about will we do what is urgent or will we do what is important? And when you do what is important, you have to have the patience to wait for that to happen. And it's very, very hard when you've got an urgency st staring you in the face to say, no, we're not going to solve that need. We're going to go invest in our future. And that is a choice that Oregon has to make. We've heard the term digital divide. And a lot of times people refer to the digital divide in terms of who has access to the internet and who doesn't. And that is a valid way of looking at it. But I choose to look at the digital divide in another way, in a more basic way, in an economic way, because at the end of the day, it is all about economics. And there is a huge economic digital divide out there. And it's happening around the world. It's not just here in Oregon. But if we look at just here in Oregon, and we look at some economic numbers around this digital divide. The average Oregonian across the entire state makes about $30,000 a year. The average high-tech employee across the state makes about $54,000 a year, almost twice. Now, if you go right into the heart of this high-tech industry, you go into Washington County and you look at their numbers, you'll see that the average Washington County resident makes $33,000 a year. Now, I will claim there's this lot of talk about urban and uh, rural you know, divide here in Oregon and that the, the urban people are suffering economically and the rural are you know, way ahead. Well, I don't think 29 versus 33 is way ahead, especially when the 33 has the weighting of all the high-tech people. And what do you think the average wage of a high-tech worker in Washington County is? It's over $100,000 a year. So I claim that what's happening is that individuals who are participating in the new economy are being rewarded, and those who are not aren't. Now, that's an overstatement, of course. And I also will state that all businesses are making this conversion to the new economy, or you won't be a business. And what it takes is a few technical people to make that transition happen. So the other thing that's very important, if we look across the entire nation, you look at the number of IT positionings that are open. There are over 800,000 openings today, even with the economy as it is. 800,000 openings, and the average wage for an IT professional is over $100,000 as well. So again, these are the people that are enabling the rest of us to be able to participate in this economy. Now, is this just a fad? Is this, you know, information age a fad? I mean, you know, you know, the stock market kind of came down and all those dot-comers, you know, are gone and, you know, the fundamental companies are, you know, where it's all at. So isn't this just all just a fad? Well, no, it's not. Because you look at those solid companies across the board and you find they've all fundamentally invested in their infrastructure systems, in their IT systems, and in providing better services to their customers. So let's take a couple examples right here in Oregon. Harry and David, right? You've all know, heard of Harry and David. Uh, all of my relatives have heard of Harry and David. <laughs> That's how I do my shopping. I uh, actually, I think I, I think I did this year, 100% of my shopping online, and Harry and David got the lion's share of it. Now, I was talking with, uh, uh, with some the people at Harry and David. They're they're also on the Internet Commission that I was also on, and they were telling me that as they've been growing their business, there's a concept called scalability. 
right? You want to be able to scale your business very effectively. And when you l uh, work in a business that's cyclical, as is theirs, you want the ability to scale your business up and then scale your business back down when you need to so you're matching your expenses with your income. Now that's very hard for them to do. They don't like that when they have to have a lot of people on the phone, which was their primary model as a catalog company. So every, you know, uh, Thanksgiving time and then all through Christmas, they had to hire, they almost had to double their phone staff. And then after Christmas, they had to let them go. And they didn't like that process. They don't like the idea of hiring someone and letting them go. They don't like the idea of the, of the fact that they can't train them as well as they'd like them to be trained because customer service is critical. What they discovered was is that when our customers converted to the internet and, or, and ordered over the internet, they found the, they didn't need as many people to scale that business up. And matter of fact, if they had their choice today, they would have 100% of their business on the internet. Because what happened on the surveys of their customers who, who were ordering over the internet, they discovered that their customers were happier and it cost them less. And that's an important combination. Because in every business, if you invest in IT properly, you will get that combination of increased customer satisfaction and decreased costs. We, that's the way we measure a project within Intel. Another example was I was having my photograph taken by a, a photographer for a, a magazine that writ, wrote an article uh, that was back east. And this you know, photographer came and took my photo, and while, you know, in between all this stuff, I said, how did you find me? How did all this get connected? You know, the publisher's back east, you're here, I'm here, how did all that happen? He goes, my website. The publisher found him on it, and the website had a bunch of his work, did what, showed what he did, the, the publisher liked it, called him up, and voila, a connection was made. My wife isn't here, so I can confess last December, uh, 7th is my anniversary, uh, and you know, December gets real busy and lots of stuff was happening, and luckily, my uh, flower service sent me my little email that said, Jim, your anniversary's coming up in a week. <laughs> you know she had flowers. Over the holidays, uh, my uh, oldest daughter, who is uh, uh, married, and uh, we have one, our first grandchild, one year old, actually celebrated the birthday then. She, it was time for, uh, the, for Mary Jane to get a crib. And uh, she wanted a convertible crib, you know? I mean, I'm, all this new technology in cribs, let me tell you. And uh, she lives in Idaho. So, you know, we were trying to figure out how to make all this stuff happen, right? Went to the internet, looked at all the cribs, it's just sat there with her, she picked out the, sh the one she wanted, and, you know, I don't know if it got there before she did when she got home from the trip, but there it happened. Commerce is happening. Um, Stark's vacuum, right here in Portland, right? If you want to order a spare part for your vacuum, you can now do that online. You don't even have to go in. It's easier for them, costs them less money, and it's easier for the customer. Uh, if any of you are doing some reconstruction and would like a custom ceramic, uh, either tile or a, a, or a, a wash basin, uh, Donna Young, who happens to live in uh, Bend, Oregon. You can go online to her website and order your custom-made tile. These are just all examples of how Oregonians are beginning to adopt to this new way of doing business. And as, we t as I, I call these people up and I talk with them, and I, time and time again, I hear what they are discovering is they get the best of both worlds. They get to live where they want to live, and yet they get to have customers from a wide range of uh, geographical dispersion, not just people that can walk in. 800.com, one of our few startup uh, .coms that are still doing well, if you look at their customer base, you'll find that less than 3% of their customers are Oregonians. So here they're bringing in revenue, they're bringing in, uh, they're creating a company with the vast majority of those customers are out of the state. So this economic reality is here and I think it is absolutely fundamental. This long economic growth that we've all experienced has been, uh, I think, significantly impacted by the productivity generated by computers and by these networks. That is why these engineers get paid so much. That is why these IT people get paid so much. So you ask the question, how does this all relate to Oregon? 
And what is that decision that we're really making down in Salem? It comes down to our economic future. Because we were very lucky 25 years ago, someone said we need to diversify our economy. We need to get the high tech sector here. And 25 years ago, they did what they had to do to make that happen. And today, Oregon, at least in my opinion, is a much better place because of the diversity of its economy. But we need to diversify our economy again and continue to do that. I was talking with a banker, Silicon Bank, um, Silicon Valley Bank, just went up to Seattle, managing both the Seattle and the, and the Portland areas. And, and his observation is that Seattle right now is running three very strong, quote, high-tech waves. They are running the, the traditional high-tech wave itself, Microsoft obviously being the biggest part of that. They're running a huge communications wave, economic wave, and they are running a huge bioscience wave. We in Oregon had just one of those. So when that high-tech sector stalls a little, and we are beginning to experience that now, the last uh, semiconductor forecast for, uh, association said that the next year will probably be flat with, with uh, 1990 or with 2000. So for, and in the semiconductor business, flat is a hard number. We expect growth. And so the economic forecast that our, that our this economist last week, you all heard, right? He, if he commented specifically that his forecast was based on a slightly increasing semiconductor forecast. And now we're saying that may not happen. Wouldn't it be nice to have a communications wave counterbalancing that or a biotech wave counterbalancing that? Now, those kinds of things just don't happen. You have to make the investments. There are three things that I believe we have to do here. And they all start with P. We've got to focus on people. We need to focus on pipes. And we need to focus on piles of money. And let me talk about those. <laughs> the first is people. I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to become an engineer or everyone needs to become technical. What I am suggesting, though, is that we need more of those people in the Oregon economy. As an example, Intel, when we hire, every year we hire a lot of engineers. Over 80% of them come from outside the state year in and year out. Now, for a big company like Intel, that's OK. We have very strong relationships with you know, the top 25 schools of engineering around the nation, really around the world. So whether Oregon has a strong engineering program or a strong bioscience bio program doesn't really bother us one way or the other. But if you're a small company here, and you're try or you're a startup, and you're trying to grow, you don't have all those relationships. It gets to be really hard. If you're a company down valley, it gets to even be harder. If you're a company in Coos Bay, you've got a real tall order in front of you trying to go to Carnegie Mellon and convince one of those engineers that they want to move to the you know, Oregon coast. It just simply isn't going to happen. And so the import strategy is not going to work across the entire state. Is it important for every business across our entire state to make the conversion to the 21st century and to the information age? I claim it is. And if we think that's important, then we're going to have to do what it takes to get those technical people trained in this state. Because the reality is, is where kids get educated, they tend to stay. I grew up in Southern California. I went to school in Northern California. I stayed in Northern California until the company I worked for, Intel, moved. And I was grateful that they did. I didn't, I didn't know it at the time, but I'm very grateful that they did. So it's important that we invest in our kids. And there are, again, three specific things that we need to do as we focus on trying to educate our workforce. First, we need to double the number of engineers. Even doubling the number of engineers will not satisfy the needs that we have across this state. The second thing we need to do is we need to strive for excellence. In, in the, in the high-tech world, being number two means you barely survive. Being number three says you get bought. 
Good is not good enough. You either are the best or you're not. And for our high-tech sector to survive long-term, we need to have a top 25 school of engineering. We are the only high-tech region in the United States that does not have a top 25 school of engineering associated with it. We need that desperately. The sex, next thing we need to do is we need to diversify ourselves. High-tech is great, I love it, but it's not the only thing in the world. We need uh, to diversify and, be, and have a top 25 school in, in the bioscience area. We have a phenomenal asset in OHSU and OGI. These two institutions are coming together and they have the core capability to become a top 25 bioscience school. But we have to invest in them. Now these investments, as I said, aren't going to pay off immediately. It's a five year, maybe, probably 10 year, most likely a 15 year kind of return before all of a sudden you see a lots of new companies emerging out of these uh, environments, out of our top 25 school of engineering, out of our top school in bioscience. Because if you look at the major economic engines of the internet companies, you'll find the vast majority, like 90 plus percent, will all be strictly associated with a, a top university. You'll find that the professor left, or a graduate student left, or a team of them left to form that company. Because that's what that leading edge research does. It creates those new ideas, and they take those ideas, and then they turn them into economic engines. How many of you heard of Qualcomm? Probably some of your phones are Qualcomm phones, or at least the innards are, right? Um, that company, 10, I don't know if it's 10, yeah, 10 years ago, didn't exist. But yet, it came out of San Diego, University of San Diego. UC San Diego, excuse me. So again, very tight. That one company is now over a billion dollars in revenue. What would that be like if we had one of those companies here in Oregon? And if we're going to solve our problem, if you go back now, we go back to Salem. Why aren't we investing in these top 25 school of engineering or the top uh, bioscience school or doubling the number of engineers? Well, we are investing some. At least the governor's proposal has 20 million of the 40 million needed. So he, we are taking a step. But why aren't we doing, going all the way? Because we don't have enough money. Why don't we have enough money? Because we don't have enough revenue in the state. Our economy is growing slower than almost every other Western state. We don't have the economic base we need. And what happens is, this is one of those things, at least in the high-tech world, where if you get behind, you'll get further and further and further behind, and you'll never catch up. Because you've got to get to critical mass. And we have some natural assets that we've got to take advantage of, or they will go away. So investing in people is critical. And, and, and if I was to summarize that, it means investing in our higher education system. Now, I'm all for a liberal education. Actually, the school I picked to go to, luckily they picked me, uh, was uh, my undergraduate only required me to take three non-engineering classes, which I was great, grateful for, because those are the three lowest grades I got. <laughs> But in general, that was then and now is now, and I think having a, a more diverse uh, education is critical. I, I totally agree. Um, but we have to invest in that. And again, if you look at the current budget proposal, you'll find that uh, if you look at higher ed, the summation of both the, the entire higher ed budget and OHSU, you'll find that the, the governor has proposed basically a flat budget year to year, even though the overall budget is growing by 13%. So I think that that's something that needs to be looked at and needs to be reevaluated. Because if we're not creating the people, we're not going to create the economic engine. And if we don't create the economic engine, we're always going to be in this spot where we don't have enough money to invest. And there are a lot of social issues that I would like the state to be investing in. But I think, first of all, we've got to make sure that the core, the root cause, is being addressed. And that root cause is we've got to make sure that the revenue is growing in the state. That means we need strong economic development, which means we need people. The second thing I will briefly touch on are pipes. Pipes are really a, 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 the notion of communications. When you log on to the internet, 
does the, the when you're connected between your computer and that server somewhere that uh, is serving up that information, that's over what we uh, call pipes. It's the communications bandwidth. And if you're on a little on a phone line, a dial-up modem, you have a little pipe. If you're on a T1 connection or you're on a LAN at work, you probably have a big pipe. And you know, if you're at a university, you might even have a bigger pipe. And you know, a lot of you may have experienced DSL into the home where you can get more bandwidth. That's all talking about bandwidth. And those in turn are pipes. For a community to be able to participate in the 21st century, they have to be connected to the internet in a, in a diverse, rich way. Now, Portland is, is fairly well connected, not everywhere. But what you'll find is where high-tech companies locate is where they can get connected to very high-speed bandwidth. It's just fiber. You probably, when you drive around the streets, you see these big yellow conduits, right? Or yellow, sometimes orange. That's what's being laid. I mean, Portland's been uh, torn up for I don't know how long. Every street I seem to go down is always being constructed. No, they're not putting in sewers, or maybe some of the cases they are. But the vast majority of the time, what they're putting in is fiber. And it's, that's what's the lifeblood of any high-tech company. And for the rest of the state to fully participate in the 21st century, we as a state have to make sure that we are looking at how the entire state is being planned. There are places inside of Salem that will know where every road is, they know where every power line is, but if you went down there and said, where's the fiber in this state, they wouldn't have a clue. And that's something that's got to change. We need to manage that. The third thing I talked about were piles of money. Actually, that's the easiest problem to solve. At least it is for formation of capital for businesses. If you go back just three years, you, you'd be lucky to find three venture capital firms in this state. Now we have over a dozen, and I've, I've uh, heard we actually have uh, close to 16 or 17, though I haven't confirmed that yet. So that money will flow. The other money that I believe will flow is the money to support the university system once the state makes a commitment. Because if you look at the specific proposals, all of them require matching dollars of one kind or another. And industry very much wants to participate and be part of the solution. But what industry won't do is lead it. The state is going to have to stand up and say, it is important that we have a strong higher education system, and it is important that we, and we will invest in it. Now, we will ask people to match that investment or overmatch it. As in the top 25 school area, the, the, for every dollar the state puts in, the institution has to match that two, maybe three to one. So they can be very highly leveraged. But it takes the commitment of the state to say, this is important. And, and important biennium after biennium after biennium. Not give it on one biennium and take it back the next, which we have had a history of doing in this state. So as I wrap up, I would like to give each of you an AR. That's a high-tech term. We, are, we like to talk in acronyms. AR stands for Action Required. Everyone understands the word action? Good, we like that. Required means not optional. <laughs> Must do. So the, the AR is if you believe that our state's economic future is indeed going to be driven by people, then I would encourage you, not encourage you, require you to write a letter to our governor and write a letter to your representative and write a letter to your senator saying higher education must become a priority in this legislative session and we need to fund it at the appropriate level. Because if we do not do that, then we will, by default, become a second-class state. And believe me, a lot of my friends in California and a lot of my friends in Colorado all say, you've got a great place to retire. And they'll come, and they'll probably retire here. But retirement home is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a vibrant economy in which my kids, as they grow up, and have their families will be able to live and be able to survive in this state. We need high paying jobs that are, are driving the economy. We have that capability if we're willing to make the investment. And just like my ribs as I'm feeling them right now and my chest pounding every time I take a deep breath, I realize that I'm going to have to take some pain before I get the gain. I'm going to have to make the investment and continue to make that investment while I wait for that return. 
But five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, that return will come. A Qualcomm-like company can and will emerge out of Oregon's economy, multiple Qualcomm-like companies. And we will have our billion dollar businesses beginning to form here that are paying their employees better than higher than the average Oregonian wage. $29,000 is nice, but it's not good enough. $54,000 is a lot better. And I want to see a lot more of those $54,000 type jobs across all of Oregon. And for that to happen, we have to make this investment. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for uh, uh, listening to me. And I'm now open for questions. Mr. Johnson, you and your firm have taken a great deal of initiative in making sure that the education will be there for the next generation of employees, um, and you've also invested in that. What are some of the ARs that um, others need to, to take? Um, what, are the, what are the complementary actions that need to be taken, and, and by whom? Well, as I mentioned, some of the things I wasn't going to talk about, um, is, it, is there a lot that, that business can do? I think it's, uh, you know, one of the values that we have as a corporation is that, uh, that we would become a positive asset in the communities that we work in. And we take that very seriously. And because education is so important to us, uh, we encourage all of our employees to participate in that and to not only their own continuing education, which we'll pay 100% of, but also any um, way that they can contribute back to the education system with their, for their kids or for others. And in general, the high-tech community is very good about doing that. But we need a lot more of that. We need a lot more of that. And it really comes down to time. Uh, a great program that we're uh, experimenting with, we've adopted two elementary schools, as an example, where our employees go in and uh, they work with very young kids, very similar to SMART. The SMART program, uh, many of you probably heard of, is where you know, adults go in and they read a book for, to a very young child and they help encourage them to read. Right? Well, we're, the CLICK program is similar to that, except it's around computers. Right, it's introducing kids to computers and making sure that all kids have access to computers. So we think it's really critical that kids are given this opportunity because it really is the younger generation that's going to take all of this to the next level, and we need to be investing in them. So I would encourage all businesses to really participate in the education system. Chris Smith, club member. Uh, you talked about the three Ps, and you kind of indirectly alluded to a fourth P, politics, uh, in the form of lobbying the legislature. Uh, but I'd like to ask you more explicitly about uh, electoral politics. Uh, we haven't met, but you and I have something in common. We're both high-tech people who worked on the Committee for our Oregon, uh, opposing some of the Sizemore McIntyre measures uh, this past fall. And that was a fairly unique thing for high-tech to get involved in electoral politics in that way. Uh, what's your outlook for involvement either by the high-tech companies but also by the high-tech employees who are somewhat notoriously AWOL in the political process. Uh, how do you see that evolving in the next 10 years? Uh, that's actually uh, an interesting question because the, I would say our, our employees by and large tend to be young. And I would say if you just look at the demographics, demographics of young adults and their participation in politics, you'll find that's quite low. So I don't know that high tech per se is notoriously bad, though I agree with you they are. Uh, I don't know that the, as a sector it's, it's, uh, it, it's unique. On the other hand, I do think it's very important for the high tech uh, sector to play a more active role in the community. The reality is, is that over the last 25 years, there has been a, um, uh, I'd say, a gentleman's agreement, not in the sense of it ever, whenever literally making an agreement, but it was like, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. And that's why our higher education system has really floundered for the last 20 years, is because we said, great, we, we came to this state, it's a beautiful place, it has lots of water, a lot of electricity, at least back then, and, uh, we, uh, and we said, great, we can recruit people here, and we, and we have. And that's why 80% every year come to the state, it's wonderful. But that has to change. And I think in hindsight, uh, you know, that was a short-sighted view of things. 
And I wish that 10 years ago we had made this kind of investment in trying to educate us all about the importance of our higher education system. It isn't just the high tech sector. I mean, I believe this, this, the reason the state long term hasn't invested a lot in higher education is if you look at our economic history, we haven't needed to do it. Um, tw 20 years ago, someone could drop out of high school, go down to the local mill, and get a family wage job. So there really wasn't a great need or emphasis on higher education. But, but now is now, and that's not the case. You can no longer do that. The, the, if you look at the economics of you know, education versus income, you'll find the more your education, the more your income. So we have to shift as a society, as all, of a, all Oregonians are going to have to shift and start saying education, and particularly higher education, is becoming more and more important to us, and we're going to need to invest in that. And so I believe the higher ed, or I should say the high tech sector, is going to put a lot more emphasis on that. Are we going to become an active political participant? I would probably say no. I will say on this one issue, yes. And we will very much drive and participate in the system. But we're not ready yet to go all the way. And I think the first step is to focus on what we've, is, you know, very close to our, our heart and our soul, which is education. So that's where I think you'll see us. And once we're in and we're doing, who knows how it will evolve from there. Candace Guth, City Club member. Um, you alluded to the, uh, the benefits of Oregon and how you're able to attract uh, uh, workers here because of all of the benefits of the environment. And I know that we've provided quite a few subsidies the taxpayers have to Intel over time. And it's, it seems ironic that you're looking to us, you know, to pay for a lot of the education systems when, when we look at the, um, last the last 10 years, we've grown by 20% in the state of Oregon. And I think we'll be hearing next week that the state of the, of the environment has declined over that 10-year period. And I'm just wondering what kind of a commitment can we look to Intel for, for improving that situation? Well, uh, again, I, um, I don't know that I would agree with all of you, the premise that you said, but I can say that you are, you know, Intel is one of the, is the largest uh, corporate income taxpayer in the state. We're the largest property taxpayer in the state. And if you look at the income, taxes that our employees pay, you'll find that it's a significant uh, amount of income to the state. So I would, uh, I can say I think quite honestly that, that Intel and its employees are a net positive to this community by far. You, you can do any math you want and you'll find that the amount of money that Intel and its employees contribute to the system versus the expenses associated with that are um, an, again a net positive. But that doesn't change the fundamental value that, that we, as all Oregonians, have to make this decision about higher ed. Um, I, I, I would suggest that, uh, you know, find me another company in Oregon, find me the next 10, and, well, they've donated $9 million uh, to Oregon schools. So I think that Intel has been uh, very Fort Worth uh, and very direct in its support of, of education. I mean, as an example, uh, any employee can contribute money to any school, K through college, and we will we can uh, can match that anywhere from one to one to two to one. Again, if you look at the programs of that, we we walk our talk. So I think that the question is is that is there a common um, consensus among all Oregonians that higher education is important? And right now, I would say the answer is no. There isn't that common consensus, and so. We, as a corporation, I think, are stepping forward saying we think this is important and we're willing to invest to find out if all of us think this is important. Because, frankly, if it's just the high-tech sector, then it isn't going to happen. This really is about all of Oregon. And all Oregonians need to make this decision. John Leeper, City Club member. I. Uh, very much appreciate your comment, sir. I've heard you speak before, and uh, I appreciate the leadership you have shown in the education field. Two, que two, que two questions. First, uh, I recently read something about Intel University, which intrigued me, and I thought, well, what's it all about? I knew you were going to be here, so I wanted to ask you that. Secondly, is your opinion representative of the high-tech industry 
in Oregon as it applies to higher education for that industry, not just Intel. Mm -hmm. The, um, at Intel, we very, as a, I think you've already gotten the notion, we value education a lot. Uh, engineers uh, are, the, are our lifeblood. If you look at our revenue stream, even though we're an extremely large company, you'll see that uh, over 50% of our revenue comes from products that weren't in existence 18 months ago. So things turn very rapidly, which also means that our, the knowledge of our employees is also turning very rapidly. So on average, every single Intel employee takes about two weeks a year of continuing education, of which again, Intel will pay 100% of that. So we value that a lot. We have a big internal training capability, we call it Intel University, uh, but we also allow our employees to go externally. So if we have a, 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 a engineer who wants to become a manager and he says, gosh, I wanna go to the Harvard's two week uh, executive training program, and he can convince his manager it's the right thing to do, then that engineer is off for two weeks at Intel's expense. So education is very, very important to us. You know, OGI is an example. They, uh, they provide continuing education for our employees, and I think uh, there was, uh, I think the last time I heard it, I think it was over 400 of our employees every year are going to classes uh, at OGI. So again, very tight relationship there. In terms of is Intel a lone voice? Uh, if I look at these three proposals, again, the, the proposal of doubling the number of engineers, creating a top 25 school of engineering in the state, and creating a top bioscience school in the state, you will find that those, that, those three positions are endorsed by AEA, the American Electronics Association, SAO, the or, uh, Software Association of Oregon, ETIC, which is the Engineering Technology Industry Council, and then the Internet Commission that was uh, uh, formed this summer uh, evaluated this and also endorsed those three, those three uh, objectives. So I would say that there's a very wide uh, and broad support within the high-tech community for these. And I also believe you'll find that they're willing to support it not only with their dollars but with their time. And if you look at what is really the most important thing, in order to create this top 25 school of engineering and this top bioscience school, is it's going to take our employees, the employees of high tech, to be working with those professors who are doing that advanced research. You know, we're very lucky here uh, in Oregon. Uh, you know, Intel's got its labs. These are where the, uh, the PhDs are looking at the next, next, next generation of computer usage. And so we've got the best and the brightest engineers in the world right here. We want those engineers working with the professors within the institutions in this state, working on what's the latest and best research. And from that as well, you will def that's where that new knowledge comes from that will cause new companies to be formed. So I believe, and I've been, I've been consistently reinforced by other executives in the community, the high-tech community, saying this is critical, we have to do it. Now the question becomes how, and again, are we as Oregonians willing to do this? The high-tech industry can stand up and do all it wants, put all the time it wants into it, put all the money it wants into it, but it won't happen unless we as Oregonians say it's going to happen. I'm Don Wagner, member, and I would like to ask you to flesh out the totality of what it might mean to have a top 25 uh, engineering school. You spoke of uh, uh, $20 million, and I, uh, I know you feel that's, that's too little of coming from the legislature. There's going to have to be more money, significant more money. What would you say is the total, and how might that come? In other words, uh, are we going to have uh, matching and such, and can you give us a little bit more of the picture, please? Sure. Um, out of the State Board of Fire Education, a, a proposal has uh, emerged called the Top 25 Slash Peer Improvement Program, in which the first biennium down payment for that is a $10 million investment. That proposal says we need to invest in uh, our, and, and select one school to become uh, a Top 25 and then make some investments in some other schools in some specific areas. The school that the Board of Higher Education selected, and I certainly have endorsed as well, uh, was OSU. OSU is the top school in the state, currently ranked 70th 
uh, nationwide as schools of engineering go. The second uh, school in the state that we have is PSU, and they're ranked in the 200 rank. So we clearly have, I think, the, the one we need to go focus on. Uh, PSU, uh, excuse me, OSU has come up with a plan that says it will take about $260, $270 million over a five-year period to make that happen. What they proposed was that for every dollar the state gives them, they will raise at least two, and it's probably now up to about $2.5. So again, industry, individuals, and foundations will, will pay the bulk of the money that is needed to make that happen. But again, with the money must come the technical talent, and that is again why it's so important for the, for the high tech community and to say this is important and to encourage our top engineers to participate with the other institutions. The second thing, though, is it's, we're, it's, it doesn't make sense to only be investing in Oregon State. We have other institutions that are also very good, Portland State, OGI, and again, this proposal says they also will get some money, but they too will have to match that money. And that's the big shift that's beginning to happen within our university system, is the universities are starting to act more and more like private institutions. You know, if you go to Stanford, you know, they've got a huge endowment. You go to Berkeley, they have a very good endowment because they figured out a lot earlier than we did that they needed to start acting like a private institution even though they were a state institution. And I think what then uh, you're now seeing both the University of Oregon as well as Oregon State as well as Portland State uh, uh, are now beginning to actively drive their endowments. They're saying we've got foundations, we've got to grow them. But what they need is excellence because I'll tell you, when Portland State goes to a high-tech employee and says, please donate some money, what that employee will say is, show me how you're going to be the best. And Portland State will come back and say, we've got a VLSI testing lab that is the best in the world. And they're right, it is. And they can drive on that one level where they are absolutely the best. Uh, Oregon State's going to say, we're going to be the best mixed signal processing. I mean, you've got to know exactly where they're going to be the best. And so we've got to develop this, and again, it's going to be a, a combination. But uh, I'll tell you, the high-tech community is not going to stand up and give a lot of money when the state is not saying we're committed. Because, again, in the high-tech world, you either are driving hard towards being the best or you don't drive at all. And in order to drive hard, you need all cylinders going, you need everyone saying this is the right thing. And in order for the state to say this is important, we all have to say this is important. We are a representative government here. And, and that's why I keep coming back to if we don't voice our opinions, then we will get what we get. And I don't believe that's going to be good enough. We need to focus, we need to say this is important, and we need to make it happen. Ah, <laughs> there's a question here that says, can you share any insights into the energy situation in California and Oregon as it affects uh, economic growth over the short term? Um, energy is extremely important to the high-tech community. I mean, if I was really being true to myself, I would have had four Ps, and the fourth P would have been power. Because uh, if my uh, computer is turned off because there's no electricity, uh, that's, a, that's a major problem. And reliable power was one of the original reasons that Intel came here and, is, and has, has enjoyed that for the last 25 years. And I, I will tell you that I know many executives down in California who are now looking elsewhere to expand because of their concerns about having long-term reliable power. So I cannot overemphasize how important that is. I also can say if, if California stutters because of this economically, we are definitely going to feel it. So we are all in this together. And you know, as much as it hurts me to have to turn off my lights or have to not do things that I want so that that power can be sent down to California, I can tell you, if we don't, we're going to feel it. And again, that's one of those, do you do what's important or you do what's urgent? And in this case, the urgent and the important is we got to help solve that problem. And uh, you know, I know our, our, uh, our two senators are actively trying to work that for us now. But it's critical that that get resolved. Carol Turner, City Club member. Um, I'd like to hear you speak a little bit more about why you think 
there's not an overall commitment to excellence, um, whether it's just that basically Oregonians continue to be quite tight with their dollars, or as Harriet Watson um, implied in the beginning and attributed it to you that you think Oregonians may have a deep fear of excellence. Well, you're asking me to kind of step on my own toes here. Um, I think the, it's, it's clear that excellence is what is required. And to say that there aren't Oregonians who demand excellence would be incorrect. Uh, there are many Oregonians who demand uh, excellence. But we as a society, we as a general group when we get together, uh, we tend to shun that kind of, um, of uh, I don't know if we call it being egotistical, or we call it being arrogant, or we call it being elitist. And so you can put those negative terms on it, or you can put the positive terms. And you know, maybe because I was tainted because I grew up in California, um, I've never sh uh, shied away from that. And uh, being the best means being the best. And it doesn't mean you can, you know, you can be the best and still be kind-hearted. And I think that what we as Oregonians need to do is keep the best of what makes Oregon, Oregon. But I also have to accept the reality that we now live in a global economy. And if we do not strive to be the best, then someone else will, and the economic dollars will flow there. It's as simple as that. And even though we have a beautiful place to live, and even though we will survive because people will want to retire here, the question is, will we have a very strong, vibrant economy? And I think that we do have one and can have one, but it requires us to strive to be the best. Our, you know, I, a lot of people complain about our K through 12 system. And there are many improvements that our K through 12 system must have. But if you just look at the data, you'll find that our K through 12 system produces some of the best students in the nation as measured by SAT scores, year in and year out. So maybe you could say it's a, a small percentage, it's only the kids who made it through high school, and it's only the kids who made it through high school who chose to take the test, but you know, that's the way it is across all sc schools in all states. Now, we also have the re the, the, a complementary uh, uh, position to say we have one of the highest dropout rates, which is unacceptable. But our high schools produce the best. And so we do have that capability in this state. I think that we just need to strive harder and, sh and push it all the way up through our higher education system. Dan Goldie, member. Uh, I may be the person you were alluding to uh, 25 years ago when I became director of economic development and we established the target industry program to diversify the Oregon economy by focusing on high tech, including biomedical high tech. And that, for that reason, perhaps, I am particularly interested in what happened, which was high tech tended to replace our resource industries instead of add to them. So we, instead of diversity, we got a different concentration. The result is we have a very prosperous urban area based on high tech and a very unprosperous rural area. My question is, what, as a leader in the high tech industry, can you tell us besides producing more engineers here in Oregon, we can do to bring high tech to the rural areas that are lagging way behind? Well, uh, again, the three things, again, are going to be people, pipes, and piles of money. It's the exact same thing. And the nice thing about this internet economy is it is really well suited for rural Oregon. Uh, you know, when I mentioned uh, uh, Donna Young, right? So she lives in Bend, Oregon, doing her ceramics. She's connected to the world through her internet, through her website. And what prevents a lot of these companies from doing this in rural Oregon is they don't have the technical people to do it. I, I haven't personally talked to Donna yet. I doubt Donna is technical. I doubt that Donna understands the World Wide Web. I can tell you, she, I bet you she's a very great artist and a very good business person who got the resources around her to put together a business that's successful that leverages this internet technology. So by investing in engineers, we're going to be investing in every company across all of Oregon who will be able to make the transition 
from where they are now to becoming a business in the 21st century.